All right, thanks for tuning in. This is part five of our Locks and Keys Global Cycle Analysis Series. We're going to be looking at the lock of gate 13 today, the fellowship of man, the gate of the listener. And uh, in lock and key keynoting, it is the witness. The witness of history, the witness, um, you know, it's kind of like in, uh, in a story, like in Game of Thrones, everyone was predicting, and I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but everyone was predicting that Samuel Tarly would be the one to write the book, kind of a stand-in for George R. R. Martin himself, who would write the story, you know, the one who would tell the story, uh, or like in uh, Lord of the Rings, where where Bilbo Baggins ends up writing the book, I believe it is. Or maybe it's Frodo. It's been a while since I've watched them, or read, read them, actually, first. Um, but I've always had a little bit of an affinity with J.R.R. Tolkien. Just as a side note, C.S. Lewis, who was his best friend, is thought to be a one-wing nine, and J.R.R. Tolkien is thought to be a nine-wing one. And uh, I'm a one-wing nine, and, and one of my best friends, Mike Goldstein Beck Litvin, is a nine-wing one. So I've always kind of fancied we've had a little bit of a Lewis-Tolkien relationship. In any case, um, you know, it's, it's the listener who is there to keep track of everything, to write it down. It's like history is written by the winners. Well, it really, we could say history is written by the 13s. If you have gate 13 and you're in Penta, uh, you're lending to that penta the ability to, to take the photos and to, to keep track of everything. Usually the 13 ends up doing it, but sometimes they just, you know, enable others to demonstrate the proof that you were really there. You know, that's part of 13 is to document and demonstrate that it really happened. But this is not logic. This is abstract. So it really happened. Sure, you can be sure that the points or the key facts of the story really happened, but it really happened in the sense of what happened, the connective tissue between those points, well, that's, you know, that's up in the air. And that's how it always is with the abstract. The abstract is always trying to achieve logical soundness or logical constancy, but it's not logic, it's abstract. It's not dry, it's wet. It's not future oriented, it's looking at the past. It's not about repetition, it's about the singular. And all of these things about the abstract that prevent it from ever gaining the soundness of logic. Um, so when you have a story, you know, stories are abstract. You can be pretty sure that the key points in the story happened, but you can't be sure at all the connective tissue between those key points. Interesting, that. So in the, in the Ray V. Ching, uh, just read a little bit about what they say about gate 13 here. Ra says, where the logic process demands a role for the self, the abstract demands that the self listens. <sighs> Already such a nice, powerful, right off the bat, just a nice statement. Logic demands a role, a separation of roles, a separation of concerns, uh, division of labor, and so on. That's what logic demands. But the abstract demands that the self listens. This gate is the openness of the self in interaction. It's a gate of the cross of the Sphinx and manifests direction. In the logic process, direction is a projection through which the collective is pointed towards the possibilities of the future. The abstract process is direction through reflection and points out the experiences of the past. This is a gate of the listener. This gate will always attract others who will come and share their experiences. It's the channel of the witness and the completion of the abstract process. It is the point at the end of a cycle here, the knowledge of the cycle is accumulated as memory. There is also magic in this gate, for it is the gate of the hearer of secrets. This is the role of openness. And the description is universal ideas and values in an ordered framework, which inspires humanistic cooperation. So this is a form of leadership too. The keynote that we have for gate seven is the leader, but 13 is also leadership. It's abstract leadership. It's leadership it's different than the, the logical leader who makes the prediction but doesn't have the experience, and you have to trust them despite the experience. For the 13, they do have the experience. Or maybe they don't quite have enough yet, but you're waiting for the time when they'll have just the perfect amount of experience. Or maybe they have the amount right now, and you're waiting for the time when they'll have too much experience to kick them out so a new leader can come along. A new prodigal can come along. This is from the channel of the prodigal, the design of the witness. 
So this is about witnessing our past, accumulating our collective past as memory, making sense of the past, kind of like 6447, right? This is sharing of experience. This is openness to others' experience. So we can see even at a, at a general theme, how are, we, how are we open to others' experience right now? How do we understand our history right now? Through what lens can we understand how we got here? How do we understand our accumulated memory? Well, the answer is through the key, right? And the key since 1610 to 2026 is gate 61. And so if you're watching this you know, in 2027 or beyond, this was the former key. If you're watching it before, then it's the current key. And this is gate 61, the gate of mystery. The old joke about history being his story and mystery being my story. Inner truth is the pressure to resolve the individual mystery, my story. The head center is not an awareness center. It's a pressure. That's where gate 61 is, in the head, of course. The intensity of the pressure can fuel unique inspiration or can lead to delusion and madness. The knowing circuit is outside of the collective. The frequency of mental awareness is over all time. The pressure of the unknown and knowable haunts the thinker's mind. This is the design of the thinker, or at least 6124 is. This is the pressure to know the absolute. The knowing circuit is extremely complex. There are three different fuels bringing pressure to this individual process. It helps to illustrate clearly how different aspects of our nature have a symmetry with each other, with others. 38, opposition, the fighter and 39, obstruction, the provocateur, like inner truth, are aspects out operating out of different frequencies but doing the same work. Unique inspiration is both a struggle and a provocation. The pressure to fight is spontaneous, the pressure to provoke comes in a wave, but the pressure to know stays the whole life. So there are three versions of the same thing, the splenic version, the ajna version, and the solar plexus version. The potential of struggle is staying alive in the now. The potential of provocation is the discovery of the spirit. The potential of inner truth is silence. That's what it's looking for. So this inner truth, this has been the time in history where we've gotten to know our inner truth, more so the time when we've gotten to understand our collective shared history through the lens of inner truth, through the lens of mystery, through the lens of mysticism, Starting in 1610 with, with line six, which can be a profound attunement to the collective that can lure the public to a truth, inspiration that can bring clarity to the collective, or a reliance on shop-worn cliches and slogans that may be new in their level of energy, but inevitably fall on deaf ears. The delusion that inspiration can bring clarity to the collective. This is how we began the whole process in the 1600s trying to bring clarity, trying to bring inner knowing to the collective, trying to bring inspiration and clarity, and being deluded by that, although sometimes also succeeding by having a profound attunement to the collective. We moved on, um, hold on a second, I have the dates here. One moment. So, till 1683, from 1615 to 1683, we were kind of the collective project and understanding uh, history was in attempting to bring clarity and inspiration to the collective. Starting in 1684 to 1753, we have the line of influence, line five. The enlightened father figure whose recognized wisdom and powerful assertion can mold a generation by its influence. The pressure to know that may result in influence and wisdom, or a tendency and power to want to enforce compliance to ensure lasting influence resenting challenges and demanding acceptance. So this is what 1684 to 1753, this is part of what led up to the French Revolution. The power wanting to enforce compliance and trying to guarantee their lasting influence, um, but also molding a generation. I mean, it's interesting. We can see how people were molded perhaps by those carriers of the fifth line. I'm always interested to see who in that era carried that line. You know, look through historical figures. Obviously, when we're looking at pre-1781, we can't look at a nine-centered body graph, but we can at least look at who had those activations. Who was alive in the early 1700s who was a fifth line on gate 61? 
you know, and what was their role in, in history. Moving uh, from 1754 to 1822, so this covers the French Revolution and some other interesting times, we have line four, the line of research, and the exaltation is the capacity of concentration to explore the depths of inner truth and maximize its application to fundamental principles. A lot of breakthroughs in science during this time. I mean, the whole era, of course, but look at all the research that was going on from 1754 to 1822, and the inner truth, the depths of inner truth, and the applications of these inner truths to fundamental principles, the pressure to know the fundamental principles. I mean, this is an interesting time in philosophy, interesting time in science. We have um, Romanticism. We have, of course, Enlightenment philosophers. We have Hegel. Really interesting time. So definitely looking at the capacity of concentration to explore the depths of inner truth, the pressure to know fundamental principles, and then the detriment where the tendency to expansion and integration leads to involving others in the research that may end in a diversity of confusing applications. The illusion that collaboration will enhance inspiration. So we can see that that was a time um, of going deep into inspiration and fundamental principles, but also a time where a lot of collaboration came and then the, the diversity of opinions made everything chaotic and messy. Um, we then have the only line with a blue line, which is to say the only real wisdom potential or the potential lines. The blue lines are not guaranteed. There are potentials here of gate 61, and that is gate 61, line 3, interdependence, the blue line. It is exceedingly difficult for truth to stand alone. So this was from 1823 to 1891. This is basically starting with the birth of Marx, uh, the death of Napoleon, Let's see, who else was born then? I think Dostoevsky was born around then. This is um, the time of interdependence, the birth of Marx, you know, right at the beginning of interdependence. The ability to establish relationships for the actualization of truths and through their nurturing and protective power to ensure a stable environment in which they can continue to grow. The pressure to know enhanced through collaboration or Mars in detriment with an abundance of energy and in possession of a truth the tendency to leave others behind or be crushed by their resistance. Impatience with others and the forsaking of relationships. So this mid-1800s was really a time where relationships were being formed or they were being forsaken. And we have a lot of, let's see, we have the Civil War during that time. We have um, a lot of theosophical movement and also Golden Dawn, OTO. I mean, that, that comes from before also. Um, yeah, so this was a time where we were figuring out interdependence or not. We were figuring out our ability to be patient with each other or to leave them behind and then be crushed by their resistance. Now, starting in 19, uh, sorry, 1892 to 1960, we have a time of natural brilliance. The moon exalted and so gifted by this position of far-reaching, nourishing influence, free of guile and powerfully attractive, a gift for inspiration that is both attractive and beneficial to others. So this was a really inspiring time for the world, 1892 to 1960. I mean, we had a lot of amazing movement in this time. I mean, think of all the inventions, the car, the airplane, the you know film, movies, uh, radio, all the way up to television. Um, I mean, not that they were all invented then, but just this was a real heyday. I mean, think about 1892 to 1960. What an incredible time, not to mention all the incredible psychological breakthroughs, psychoanalysis, Freud from 1895, and Jung joining him shortly thereafter. And, you know, a lot of natural brilliance in this time, and a natural brilliance to help us understand our collective past. The detriment that an early recognition of its influence becomes ego-obsessed with maximizing its effects a delusion that any inspiration deserves recognition. So, you know, this was maybe such a time of great people, but there was also the delusion that every recognition or every inspiration deserved that recognition. And then we enter into our, our kind of common era, our current, if you're watching this before 2027, from 1960 to, to 2026, we have, or 1961 rather, we have the key occult knowledge a natural psychic awareness that empowers principles of universalization, the pressure to know the mysteries through esoterics, or where a reliance on secret knowledge increasingly demands ascetic withdrawal and leads eventually to obscurity, where the pressure to know the mysteries can be so strong that one can be eventually incapable of handling exoteric realities. So that's an interesting one, right? What it's saying is, on the one hand, what, what a tremendous gift. I mean, first of all, this is how we understand our collective past 
how we understand how we got here, how we understand the history of humanity that has led to this point in evolution. Interesting, right? We've understood our collective past a number of different ways. We've understood it through as a past of based on appeal to the collective. We understood it based on influence and influencing people and a history seen through the lens of influence. We've understood it through the application of fundamental principles, research. What are the fundamental principles of history? We've understood it as interdependence of how important it is to not only depend on others, but have them depend on you and vice versa, how both of these, how this interdependence is so crucial and how we can understand history as a history of interdependence. Then we move on to natural brilliance and not only the brilliance in explaining our history, but a history as seen as a history of brilliance, a history of one brilliant invention overcoming the next brilliant and so on. And finally, we're, we've now settled in this zone, at least for the next few years here, of understanding our history through occult knowledge. Now, what is this if not human design, right? And astrology and books like Cosmos and Psyche by Rick Tarnas, and a, a great example of telling a telling of our history through occult knowledge, the pressure to know the mysteries through esoterics. Now, the downside of this is that it can lead to an inability to handle the exoteric reality. And I think we've seen this in some of the more extreme ways of understanding history and conspiracy theories and so on. People that have gone down certain rabbit holes into inner truth and occult knowledge and they've never come out. Um, I used to be a big fan of Goro Adachi, but he's somebody, you know, he said, claims to be a 33rd degree Freemason from Japan, and he, he has this whole, um, you know, he's not into human design at all, but he's into what he calls synchromysticism. And it is understanding of our collective history through mysticism, mystery, and through synchronicity and things like that. And yet, I think he's ended up more on the detriment side where he's then, and some of the people that are into his work, have lost the ability to deal with exoteric reality. You know, they're so deep in the esoterics, they can't come out. So that's the interesting side of the detriment. But by and large, I mean, that exalt has been incredible. I mean, think about how much we are now in a unique position at this point in history to understand all of history up until this point through the lens of mysticism, through the lens of occult knowledge, through the lens of inner truth, um, it's incredible. It's really incredible. It will, and that's part of the door that is closing, you know, part of the mysticism that's going away. It's not just the 1949 transforming. It's, um, you know, it's also that we're losing this access to inner truth. And what is it to lose access to inner truth, to lose access to occult knowledge? Well, it's being replaced. And what it's being replaced with is gate 54. So this is going to be our new way of understanding our history, understanding our past through gate 54, the gate of ambition. Transformation, part of channel 5432, a channel of transformation, a design of being driven. In the original I Ching, the marrying maiden, what it referred to was based on a legend of a concubine that eventually became the empress of all of China. This embodies the idea of rising up, moving up the ladder. This is a gate of drive. Since this gate is a fuel of the ego circuit and that its inherent meaning is ambition, it can easily be dismissed as a very mundane energy. It may be surprising then to discover the most mystical line is the 54-4, enlightenment and darkenment. It may appear to be an irony, but it is not. Only when one has mastered the instincts to operate on the mundane plane is transformation possible. This gate fuels the drive to transform. In biological terms, it's associated with the body's liquid production. The significance is that it is through the liquid medium that memory is stored and transported. This instinctive stream is all about memory. So, yeah, it's interesting. We're actually, um, you know, gate 13 is about memory. I just love how we see these keynotes appear again and again. And, and so 54 is also about memory. It's about liquid memory. Of course, this leads to the 32 and then the 44 and 26. Um, channel of capitalism, as we nickname it. But yeah, this is about memory and about transforming material circumstances. Interaction in its mundane social context, but also one's mystical and cosmic relationships. So 
Yeah, so what we're seeing is we're, we're no longer in the future going to be able to understand our history. We're going to lose access to our understanding of our collective history through the lens of occult knowledge. We're going to gain access to an understanding of that history in terms of drive and in terms of ambition. Who had the drive and who didn't? And, you know, what, what was the, the outcome of that drive? And that's going to be kind of telling the story of history by way of interaction and mundane social context. It's, you know, it's going to be telling the story of all of those 54s who got to become 45s, all the concubines who got to become empresses. I mean, we already see hints of it with the love of the story of the little person who makes it up big, you know, who makes it big, or of, you know, Wall Street bets saying all of these retail traders are going to make it big on the stock market and show the big ones, you know, who's boss. This is very much a scrappy Gate 54 theme. Um, the, the, the theme of all of the unknowns on YouTube becoming uh, internet sensations and all this stuff. And we're going into line six, selectivity. The ingrained responsibility in terms of maintaining security and personal identity that will naturally restrict its relationships to ones that are mutually beneficial. The energy to restrict relationships that hinder ambition. So it's going to be interesting to see that what we're being called to do collectively is to eliminate those harmful relationships that prevent material transformation, that prevent material success. We're, we're really, you know, going to be challenged to let go of and you know, maintain security and personal identity through restricting relationships with others. Restricting relationships with others. Now, as a lens of how to see history, I don't know how to make necessarily draw that together. I don't know if we'll start to see history as, oh, you know, the victors were the ones who were able to successfully restrict their relationships to ones that were mutually beneficial. Maybe we start to see history in terms of mutual benefit. You see that the winners of history are the ones that were able to maximize mutual benefit. The detriment here is a generally benefic and expansive nature that assumes that it can instill what is otherwise missing in its partners. A waste of energy. The waste of energy in maintaining relationships which hinder ambition. So we're going to see both of these. We're going to see, but it's going to be a different game. It's not about penetrating to the inner truth and understanding the fundamental principles and applying those fundamental principles or bringing that clarity to the collective or any of that. It's going to be about restricting relationships to ones that are mutually beneficial, getting rid of the, the detrimental relationships, getting rid of the relationships that prevent your ambition um, from being maximized, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to go too much. I mean, we, we can see interesting times like, you know, a couple hundred years in the future when, when line four of, of gate 54 will be active. And that's a very interesting one because that is um, the line of the human, so to speak, the most human of human. Um, it's also funny that Ra says that 54-4 being the exact middle of the gate, you know, 50% through, Gate 54 is where the human stands, but 54-6, the end of 54-6 is God and the beginning of 54-1 is the devil. So it's funny that we're, we're kind of descending over the next 400 years from the holy symbolism through the mundane symbolism to the devilish symbolism, which is kind of a funny, funny side note there. So yeah, so what is this really saying? This is saying that we're changing how we understand our history, we're changing how we witness history, we're changing the kinds of historians we're looking for. It used to be we're looking for a historian like Ra who was able to tell us our history through occult knowledge. Now we're going to start looking for historians that can tell us our history through the history of ambition, through the history of working together for mutual benefit to transform material circumstances through the history of anything that has to do with Gate 54, mundane interaction. It's very different, right? It's a very different version of history. We've gone from the occult you know, analysis of history, um, the esoteric analysis of history, to a more exoteric analysis, one that says, well, let's understand history now in terms of ambition and in terms of drive and who was really driven and was their drive thwarted by, you know, 
bad relationships that hindered their ambition and hindered their drive? Or was their drive successful? This is in a projected channel, so there's success here, just like we had success in the 61. Success in the 61 would be the success of um, knowing. Success here would be the success of material transformation, of getting ahead, of, of getting further in life. And uh, so it's gonna be interesting to see how, how this shift plays out, the shift of understanding our history, and also what kind of leader we're looking for, what kind of experience we want them to have. Do we want them to be experienced with occult knowledge, be experienced with inner truth? Not anymore, not in the next few years. We're gonna be looking for leaders who are experienced with starting with nothing and getting ahead in life. They're experienced with transforming their material circumstances. They're experienced with having drive and ambition. And it's such a different thing to look at history through the lens of drive, to look at history in terms of winners and losers, in terms of successes and failures on the material plane versus looking at history in terms of success and failure to penetrate into the deeper understandings and the occult knowledge and the inner truth. They're very, very different things. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for watching.